following interview was conducted with Calvin Schrag um, to George A. Distinguished Professor of Philosophy Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Friday, October 8, 2010 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Professor Schrag, and Good thank afternoon. you very much. Let's mm -hmm. start. Do we tell us where and when you were born and siblings that, in early years? That takes us back some years. Uh -huh. I was born That's in 1928. Good. Okay. May 4th, 1928. So I am definitely a aging senior citizen <laughs> and trying to deal with those challenges. Yeah, what did your parents do and do you have any siblings? You uh, tell yes. early years in school. Yes, okay. I was born on a rural farm near a small town of Marion. Uh, my father Is that what uh, made a living. What state was that? That's South Dakota. Okay. I mean, South Dakota. Okay. Yeah, my father was a pastor at the local Mennonite church, but in those days, the pastors were not reimbursed. That was a calling that uh, one was simply asked to do. So he made his living farming and was a quite successful farmer uh, because he had seven sons who helped him with farm work. Why don't you pull your chair up just a little bit more so you get closer then? Okay. So, so um, and I was, yes, I, I was uh, the last one out of nine children, the two oldest, my two oldest siblings were uh, sisters, and then seven boys. So that's, uh, yeah, that was my first encounter with the world, a very <laughs> rural area, uh, southeastern part of South Dakota. What sort of, what, what kind of farm? Do you have animals or crops? We had, what? yeah, it was mainly, it, it was very diversified. Yeah, in those days, uh, uh, both the crops and the livestock were diversified. We had uh, mainly corn and wheat, mainly corn and wheat, and then later soybeans became a good cash crop. Uh, we always had a significant uh, number of pigs because that was good for the market. And we, of course, had our cows and took the milk to the local creamery where they would separate it. And uh, then we had horses. Yeah, we had horses to do the horse work. So my first experience, my first experience with cultivating the corn was with t team of horses. Mm -hmm. And then the tractors moved in in the later 30s and 40s. So we shifted from horsepower to machine power. But it was it was a rather austere lifestyle because how large is the town? Very large. Pardon? Was the town very large that you grew up no, in? No, the town had uh, about eight hundred residents. Yeah. So you had a small grade school. The grade sc my grade school was a rural grade school, a mile from the farm. So I'm yeah I, I had my first education, first eight years at a small rural school, about four miles from town, but only about a mile and a quarter from the, from the house where I lived, which of course meant that uh, you would be walking both morning and evening. Uh, but this was the era of small school houses, yeah. Grades to one to through eight. And in the district that I was in, I don't recall there ever being more than about 20 students, grades one through eight. And there were some grades in which there weren't any students. Well, but it was interesting. It was, it was a rather unique experience. And uh, of course, you immediately think of the disadvantages of that. Well, certainly, there were some disadvantages. But you know, there is this one advantage that uh, I, some, I think people fail to realize is that it, particularly if you're interested in learning from grades one, two, three up, you're always going to hear the upper grades recite. 
Were there two classes in the one, two grades in one classroom, or did you have separate classrooms? No, just one classroom. No, just one classroom. For all the grades? For all the grades, yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, and the, oh, and the teacher had her desk off to the left, and then there was then there was the recitation bench, the recitation bench, and then behind that were the first graders, and then the second graders, and the fourth graders, up to the eighth graders. No, no, we were all in one, in, in one room. And that's why I say that when I think back, I probably learned as much from listening to the, sure the reciters a grade above me than I did doing the Things homework that, that's, that I was supposed to do. Yeah, did you not have a desk though for writing? Oh yes. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah, we each had our individual desks. Oh okay. Oh yes. We each had our individual desks. And these were the old desks where the top would go up and you'd have your books there and your pencils and your watercolors and uh, all the paraphernalia that you needed right. to get through. But that was that's how I started. Wonderful. District number fifteen. Rural school near Marion, South Dakota. Oh, very. Did the um, did you have any rest um, recreations? You go outside for uh, any act activities? Oh any yes, uh -huh. yes. All right, we had we had the uh, outside activities. Uh, we didn't play baseball. We played softball. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we did have a you know one of these old merry-go-rounds that. You would, somebody would be pushing I know. you and the others would be hanging on. So we had outside activities and one thing that, that the boys looked forward to was playing another s district, see? So uh, most of the rural schools had enough <laughs> to at least make up a team. <laughs> so we had those, uh, those activities. We also had uh, competing activities in spelling, in map uh, identification, and in arithmetic, yes. So, uh, given, given the paucity of resources, I think they did about as well as they could with the rural education right. at that time. Very good, yes. Yeah. Well, after that, then where'd you go to high school? Then I went to Marion High School. Was that in, that in the same town then? That was the town that was closest to the farm, mm -hmm. four miles. So I went to Marion as a freshman and uh, uh, received my high school education at Marion High School. And there, uh, uh, the graduating class that I was in, we had 21. We had 21. So here again, I don't recall a time when the highest whole high school had more than a hundred students. Yeah, because you see there was another small uh, village down the road that had its students from the surrounding areas. The, uh, high school. High school, right. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, no, high school, yeah. High school was uh, was interesting because we did have we did have a math teacher as superintendent who was who never finished his doctorate but had done graduate work in his field. Now that was sort of unusual, and uh, I remember I remember uh, his yeah his instruction and. Uh, he had us take the, the Princeton tests and all that. So that was quite, our, our high school was quite uh, distinguished in that regard. Fortunately, he, uh, he left for another position before, before I graduated, but that was all right because I had sort of the basic foundation in math from him and the next superintendent that came in, well principal, we called him principal, uh, came in was uh, in social science. 
So we got a nice sort of diversified right. uh, right. education mm -hmm. in those four years at this uh, small city high school. Right, yes. And then uh, next came college. How did you, I know you went to Bethel, how, how did you decide to go there and how did college come I about? went to Bethel. I went to Bethel because Bethel is a church college uh, connected with the with the Mennonites. Okay. There's there are Bethel in Kansas, Bluffton in Ohio, and uh, there are other Mennonite colleges, but these were the three main colleges that um, emphasized uh, academics and were the more liberal branch of the, the Mennonite uh, uh, community, which itself is a very interesting development. That is, they go back to the Anabaptists of the 16th century. The Anabaptists were sort of the radical wing of the Protestant Revolution, and they were a little too radical, so they did. They got in trouble in Switzerland, where my four forefathers started. We were called the Swiss Mennonites. But they got in trouble with Zwingli and his more orthodox view of Protestantism. And actually, some of them were drowned in Lake Zurich. And I remember growing up and seeing on my dad's bookcase. He didn't have many books, but he had, he had important books. The Mennonite Martyrs Mirror, which recorded the martyrs of the church. Uh, so that was, yeah, uh, that was, uh, uh, that was the, yeah, the approach to religion that I grew up with. Went to Bethel, which was a Mennonite school. Uh, I, I did finally, le I left the Mennonite church, but only after I came to Purdue uh, because um, there weren't any, any Mennonites close by. Also, I did, in the course of my education, uh, become a little more critical of some of the doctrinal aspects of organized religion, whatever it might be. In any case, that was why I went to Bethel. My oldest, my three, yeah, three of my older brothers who went on the academic life also went to Bethel. Mm -hmm. And so that was the sort of thing to do. Now at Bethel, I uh, had, as one of my professors, uh, uh, Dr. Kaufman, who did his, who did his graduate work at Yale. All right. He did his graduate work at Yale in psychology and then psychology of religion. And uh, he suggested that I might apply to Yale for a scholarship, which I did and which I won. So I got the scholarship to go to Yale Divinity School. And uh, by that time, by that time I had already decided that I would not follow the ministry. I had one brother who followed the, the route of the ministerial track and uh, is retired now in Oregon, all right. Uh, but I was still interested in religion uh, as something to teach. And Yale Divinity School was strong in that. So I stayed at Yale. What was your major in, in college, sir? What did you in major? college, yes, yeah, in college, I had a social science major. What it was, it was a, it was a, a clearly a multidisciplinary major. In the social science here, this, this was yeah, okay, yeah, in the social sciences, but we also had to have uh, requirements filled in some of the other areas, but the the uh, emphasis was very much on on multidisciplinary education. Uh -huh. And then when I got uh, to Yale, I had already decided that I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't enter the ministry. Uh, 
might continue with an interest in philosophy of religion, which I did, but in moving from Yale to Harvard, uh, I became more and more interested in formal philosophy. Uh, but uh, kept, yeah, kept my, uh, yeah, my background was very, uh, came in very handy for me because the third year after I'd returned to uh, Harvard, I had a Fulbright for a year of study in Heidelberg, okay, and came back from Heidelberg and there was Paul Tillich, university professor at Harvard, situated at the pedestal. Right? All right, the, the Harvard University professorship is patterned after the, uh, the, uh, the Oxford distinguished professorship. And there were only, I think, three at the time. Tillich was the fourth one. Well, Tillich, of course, was at that time known as one of the world's top theologians, but also philosophers. And uh, at Harvard, taught a graduate course in philosophy. He taught a course at the Divinity School, and then he taught a course at Harvard College, all right, which were sort of the main distinct units. And uh, when I came back from, uh, from Heidelberg, he wanted to know if I might be interested in being his assistant. Yeah. T teaching fellows is what we were called at Harvard. I had been a teaching fellow for John Wilde, who was my major professor, uh, but uh, Tillich wondered if I, would, if I would be interested in doing that. So I could hardly turn that down, not realizing all the implications of it. Uh, we soon found out that there was no place in Cambridge, at Harvard, no classroom big enough to handle all those who wanted to be in Tillich's class. So we moved to, to uh, a theater, the theater which had three tiers and squeezed in all the students that wanted to sit at the feet of this famous Paul Tillich. So uh, that's, that's how my background in philosophy of religion uh, came into play, mm -hmm. being Tillich's assistant. Then you you finished your PhD. I finished my PhD. Okay, was he only there for a year? Or? No, oh. no, he stayed for four or five years. He was, and the day the year after I assisted him is when he made the cover of Time magazine. There are only two philosophers, theologians, who ever made the cover of Time. One was John Dewey, okay, and the second was Paul Tillich. Oh, okay. So Tilly, yeah, and Tilly became a common theme for discussion at cocktail parties. That was interesting, how his, how his reputation spread like wildfire. Yeah. Where had he come? Where had he been before he came to Harvard? All right, he was, he was, uh, educated. He was educated at. Um, uh, Mainz, and then at one of the Eastern universities, and then got a very distinguished appointment at Frankfurt. Frankfurt had, had a cluster of influential philosophers. Uh, yeah, they, were, they were schooled in uh, socialism and Marxism, so there was that aspect. Um, but Tillich kept his, uh, had his own system going and was at the university 33, 34. All right, 
that's where you had the uprising. I don't know if you remember all those details. Students had, in Germany had a lot of power. And the students protested when the black shirts moved into the university to cleanse it, right? And Tillich publicly denounced the, uh, the uh, Germans coming in. And as a result of that, he was fired on the moment. He didn't have to prepare his lecture for the next day because the Frankfurter Allgemeine had in bold prints Paul Tillich fired, released from Frankfurt University. Okay, it so happened that Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a theologian at Union Seminary in, in uh, New York, uh, was in Germany and he knew of Tillich and on the spot gave him an invitation to come to Union Theological Seminary, which he did and uh, then moved to Harvard and ended his career at Chicago. Even though he was beyond retirement age, all these universities still wanted to, sure. to get a hold of him. Yeah, right, okay. Let's so that's sort of my, yeah, my right. education from grade one through, through the my PhD. PhD. Right. Yeah. Uh, your career path before you came to Purdue, you came to Purdue in what, 57? Um, I came in. To was that Purdue right after you got your PhD? 57. Okay. Against the protestations of my major professor. All right. In the fifties, fifties GIs were coming back. Universities uh, were talking about the closing college door. We don't have enough professors. All right. And they still had the old boy network where your major professor, of course, would find the place for you to go. Okay, so it was somewhat amusing. But I was, I was caught sort of betwixt and between. Um, John Wilde, my major professor, got his second Guggenheim for the spring semester to go to Europe. I finished, I finished my dissertation yeah, at mid mid year, so I would be, I have a better chance of getting a position somewhere. All right, so. So uh, at the New York meetings, the APA, the American Philosophical Association, met, and I attended, as the most of the graduate students were looking for jobs. Sure. I saw this advertisement from Purdue. I didn't know anything about Purdue. I heard about Purdue football. Didn't know much about Purdue. Okay, so you have to remember now, uh, John Wilde was beginning to get ready to, to leave on his, his Guggenheim, and he did. See, he did at the meetings. He did introduce me to a number of different professors who were looking for replacements. And some were good schools, University of Virginia, uh, there was a good girls' college, women's college. Uh, so those were possibilities. But I went to, I came to West Lafayette for the interview because, well, of curiosity. What might they have? Well, when I came, I found that they only had four philosophers Clitheroe, you remember Clitheroe, hey, Szczynski, Gass, and Hayward. I was the fifth. None of them in my area. So, okay, down the road, I wouldn't have to wait for someone to die to teach my, my area, which was continental philosophy, which was the philosophy of Wilde and uh, Tillich. That's my specialty, is continental philosophy. And went back to uh, Cambridge, and it was pretty much the day before Wilde left for Europe. And I said, "Look, uh, this is these are some of the people I met. They're young. They're all young. 
There's no dead wood there. <laughs> They're all young. And the salary was competitive. In 1957, Purdue's salary was competitive with some of the Eastern schools. All right, so this is it. Okay, he looked at me. Yeah, salaries, that's okay. Yeah, but uh, what, yeah, we take that position. And that'll give you a year or two to look around and get a real position. <laughs> it's always easier, his argument, but it's true. It's easier to move from a university to another university than it is to move from a small college to a university. And he was, yeah, he was hung up on having graduate students. Uh, well, I had to be honest. Uh, there was no PhD program at Purdue. I withheld information. I didn't even tell him there was no philosophy major. But, but, but you were interested in more. Uh, but I could see what was happening at the time. And a friend of mine uh, at Harvard knew Koffler. Henry Koffler, the Ringavel. All right. He was the one who put biological sciences on the map at Purdue. Microbiology uh, is what changed the, the direction there. Henry Koffler and, and I had this common friend at Harvard who told talked to Henry about something and found out that they needed a philosopher. So I spent, I was single, I spent the first three, four days with the Kofflers, who lived right down my sunset, while I looked for a, for an apartment or a, a, a place, uh, place of residence. So it was, uh, uh, it was that how I came, uh, came to uh, Purdue. Came to Purdue. Okay. Yeah. Nineteen fifty-seven. What, was, what uh, was your initial teaching? Tell them about that. And what was the campus like then? All right. Where did you? Fourteen thousand. Uh, I remember. Or was it twelve thousand? Somewhere down the line, we can get the fact. Uh, Nineteen fifty-seven. Purdue was twelve or fourteen thousand students. But definitely growing because the GIs were coming back, and yeah, uh, okay, no, uh, no uh, philosophy department. Uh, we, we were the philosophers were squished in with the historians and the, and government, political science, under the rubric of the department of history, government, and philosophy. All right, so there were three disciplines in one department, okay. which had certain advantages. Right. But then, as each grew, we had to split off into separate departments. And that, again, I should be able to give you the exact date, but I, I don't, must have been in 61 or 62. Yeah, it was six, yeah, it was 62 that we became a separate department and then had to hire a head. And within three or four more years after that, we had enough students to convince the administration that we should have a doctorate in philosophy. Uh, so that's how the humanities grew. It was, and then the historians had the doctorate in philosophy. But when I came in 57, I think the only school that had, only department that had a doctorate was English. And that was a kind of mixture of different disciplines. Mm -hmm. But in any case, those were the years of 57 to 70. Those were the years when the... Uh, universities all over the United States experienced their yeah. rather incredible growth. Okay. What was your, tell us about your research that uh, you were involved in, other researchers. All right, already, 
already at Yale. I took some mm -hmm. courses in cognitive philosophy. But it was John Wilde at Harvard, senior member of the philosophy department at Harvard, who sort of took an interest in me. I had done one, I did a course for him in which I wrote a paper on Carl Jasper's philosophy, one of the noted existentialists at the time. And he, he very much liked the paper and he knew that I could handle German because German was the first language I spoke. He, uh, my parents were yeah, the, first, the second generation uh, settlers and uh, uh, my mother had a, never spoke English very fluently, she could, but at home we would talk in German. German. Yeah. So that was an advantage for me. So uh, uh, I, uh, I opted for what we call the continental track in philosophy. Continental track in philosophy. All right. That involved, particularly during those years, the existentialists, uh, going back to Soren Kierkegaard, who was Danish, but influenced French and German philosophers. So the continental philosophy consisted primarily of people in Germany like Martin Heidegger, Karl Jaspers, uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, and who would I name now? Uh, yeah, the name is Links me. Uh, any case, uh, I uh, yeah, I was doing some work in German philosophy, Jaspers and Heidegger, and uh, that's what yeah I gave rise to my application for a Fulbright. So Wilde suggested, look, why don't you get a Fulbright and spend a year in Europe? And again, I was fortunate to be able to pick my university, which was Heidelberg. Okay. Yes, I excuse him. And, and that's you talked where, about your fellowships, right? That's where, yeah, that's where that stuff was going on. Mm -hmm. That's where Gadamer was teaching, and Karl Löwith was the other person. L-O-W-I-T-H. All right. These were the senior philosophers. So, the, yeah, so I got, I, look, my research my main research and study was begun at Harvard, but actually it was carried through in Heidelberg. And then I came back to Harvard and finished my, my doctoral work and also taught some courses there in uh, continental philosophy. But that's how I got into it. Mm -hmm. Historical accident. Uh, yes. Yeah, sounds I good. Could have been another professor. Yeah, yeah would, there you go. Yeah. You, you got a couple Point. fellowships too, didn't you? Pardon? You got a couple fellowships. You had that National Endowment of the Humanities in 67. Okay. Yeah, which was this? Uh, no, the, the, just a fellowship in yeah. the National Endowment, 1967. Right. Yeah, this was, yeah, this was one of the, yeah, uh, fellowships they had for either a semester or a year. And I got, I got one of those, I forget now if it was a whole year, but yeah, I managed to get that. that that's when the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, right. they started, yeah, they started. So I got into that by getting a study fellowship, and then later I had three, I had two NEH summer seminars here at Purdue. For the college teachers? That's right. right. And then, I was going to ask you. Yeah, and then the third one was an institute, which right. was a little higher level. Mm -hmm. And there I had, an ass I had assistant philosophers from different universities, Southern Cal and, uh, and Northwestern, who would, who would come to campus for a week or even three, four days. So it was an institute where the 
participants and then we could choose 20. For the seminars, you could only have 12. And the point of the seminars was to get, get young philosophers who were at small colleges and were sort of isolated. So the, there was a, a specific reason why they distinguished the seminars from the institutes. The institutes now consisted of scholars who already had made a kind of name for themselves, sure. but now were interested in discussing their theses and findings with uh, a collection of senior philosophers. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the exciting moments of my, my higher, my education, yeah. Did they come from uh, all across the country? Yes, mm -hmm. and Washington wanted us to get as much of a geographical representation as possible. <coughs> Don't use it as your main criteria, they said, but yeah, get, uh, get representatives from all over the United States. And that was easy for me to do because that was the time that existentialism, phenomenology, and hermeneutics, these mm -hmm. European modes of philosophy were making significant inroads in the United States. So I had a good, a good representation, good geographical representation, and a good representation of difference in points of view. So yeah, the existentialists would argue with the phenomenologists, and yeah, others would argue sure. with others. Yeah. So it was a very, yeah, very uh, enriching, enriching, yeah. a very enriching uh, experience for everyone involved. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of the administration things. You were the interim head in 1972. Okay. Interim head. Yeah, of, of the uh, Department of Philosophy. That's right. See, that was before we had. A head. God, now I'm a bit confused. When was 19... That's 1972? Oh, 72. Yeah. No, 72. Then we had, yeah, no, we had a, uh, we had a head, Frank Parker, and, um, and then he left, and then I was interim mm -hmm. for a year, and then I think it was Grabau who took over. Yeah. Did I you forget. not? Did you want to be considered to be the head? No, oh. I, I just wanted to help <laughs> Mao so we could we could smooth get the water. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, uh, but look, no, I I had this thing about administration, and I had they had to pull my leg a bit because I didn't want to do it. But after I did it, I was glad that I did it because I learned a lot about the structure of the university. Yeah. Similar comments I've heard from others. I right? bet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And other administration, and I want to talk to you about this. You were associate dean of Hissey in 86. That's when Bob and Ringel that's, was. And, curriculum, and he was the head. He was the dean. The dean of the school, right. See, Bob Ringel and I came about the same time. And, okay. Yeah, and he, of course, had made a significant name for himself in audiology and speech science. And then he moved into the deanship from there. And that's right. And then was elected dean. All right. And uh, this was already I, after I had received my distinguished professorship. Yes. I'm going to ask you about that, but go ahead yeah. with the uh, associate and dean. Everybody's wondering, why the dickens? What are you doing in the administrative unit? Well, the answer to that is, is quite clear. Bob Bringle and I and a number of others had always been dissatisfied with the core curriculum that we had. In the school? In the school. Now, you can imagine, it's going to be difficult to have a core curriculum if you have people in the humanities, in the history, social sciences, audiology, and uh, women and men's recreation. Yeah, it's going to be difficult right. to do that. So he wanted me for that particular reason. Two years. I said, I'll do it for two years. But handle primarily the curriculum, the core curriculum. Right, and that was my primary, that was my primary 
uh, an item deal. that I had to deal with. Uh, and the other one was uh, trying to integrate the, the uh, uh, ancillary combinations that were not departments but are studies, women's studies, uh, uh, you have Jewish African, studies. African American studies? Yeah, American studies. I think that was one of the first. Very and successful. Right. And the African American studies was in there at that time too, was it not? African American studies? Right, okay. right, right. And so what we had to do, we had to have uh, someone who sort of would oversee these different areas, American studies, and then we had philosophy and literature, Margaret Church. Mm -hmm. Is that, you remember Margaret yes. Church? Margaret Church and I got together and we set up this doctoral program in philosophy and literature, which is still going strong. But in any case, uh, Bob also wanted to have me meet with with these different groups and that yeah that wasn't much fun because there was also argument about who gets most of the the TAs now American studies is the oldest should get more than some of the others so those were my uh, big challenge working pulling working, right working right, around working right. working the chips on the on the drawing board <laughs> hmm. Then uh, you were, um, were you chair of the University Senate at one time? Yes, I was chair of the University Senate. Well, there's another spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in your halo, in your <laughs> crown. Yeah, from the administrative sort of point of view. Yeah, they, uh, I had been member of the Senate for some time. And uh, yeah, I was head of the, I was chairperson of the, of that one committee, Faculty Affairs, Academic Affairs Committee. And it was that, it was that committee that established the equal, that established 10 year, established 10 year for people who were teaching only half time. Yeah, that was a time that you could get couldn't get tenure unless you were employed full time, mm. and a lot of the women were teaching half time, so there was that element came into play. But our yeah, our uh, our um, program in. Uh, in uh, the um, the uh, uh, area of yeah the academic side, managed to get that through. We managed to get that through. So then they guess they thought maybe I could be of some help to them as as president of of the Senate, and that's when. Uh, President Hansen came in, and President Hansen, I still say, has to be acknowledged as the one who made the who made a a, a gigant who helped Purdue make a quantum leap from what it had been up to that point known mainly as uh, engineering and agricultural institution. Uh, moving beyond that, not sacrificing any of that, but moving beyond that to a full-fledged cosmopolitan university. Yeah, that was an interesting time. That was in, so I was head of the, I was chairperson of the university senate while Art Hansen was president of the university. And um, the chairman of the Senate has to work together with the president. And, uh, and my relationship with Hansen, who 
died too early, just this last year. Just this past summer, just in July. Pardon? July, he passed away. In July. Yeah. I had no problems, no problems at all, either on helping the humanities, because he had this knowledge of philosophy and religion. He used to give, have discussion groups on the Book of Job. He had this fascination with the Book of Job and the problem of evil. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine <laughs> how happy the, the humanists were to have a president uh, like with, uh, with those interests uh, steer the university. He did, he, um, there was some program in which he was involved in that with the problem of evil, wasn't it? That Hansen was involved? Yes. Right. He, he, he funded it. Mm -hmm. He funded it. It was held on campus here. It was held on campus, yeah. And we invited, we invited, let's see, Bill Rowe and I were representatives of Purdue. And then we had uh, four, four or five more specialists who dealt with the problem of evil from different universities. Yeah, that, that, was, that was a rather remarkable conference. Uh, the proceedings of which, some uh, proceedings I think have been translated, but not in one, in one uh, uh, a journal. They made their way into other journals. Mm -hmm. But again, yeah, that was that was uh, clearly a result of Hansen's uh, willingness to give that theme prominence. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the A Distinguished Professorship. What a nice honor. Yeah, that was quite a surprise. Art Hansen's the one who called me on that. Yeah, I had heard for the longest time the person who got the Distinguished Professorship was not to know that he or she was running. Yeah. Or was being considered or not. Or being considered, right. Okay. Yeah, and, and there's a reason for that. Look. All right, so somebody says, okay, you're, you're going to be one of three who might get it. Yeah, uh, that has some complications. Uh, and, uh, and I had, yeah, I got wind somehow <laughs> that I was being considered, uh, but was still very much surprised when after the Board of Trustees meeting at four o'clock or five, I was still in the office, Hanson called me to congratulate me that I'd gotten the George A. Distinguished. Do you know how they happened to select that particular, do you know? Because what, there was. You should get free tickets to the Ross A. All there the you go. That's right. That's what I told everybody when I Wonderful. got there. Wonderful. I never I mean, heard I mean, that, but I came right out I'm in the 50-yard, should be in the 50-yard line. Season tickets forever. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it didn't extend to that degree. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, uh, that gave me some uh, more resources to travel to conferences. Sure. And by that time, my work had already been translated into five or six European languages, so I would do a lot of traveling. All right. Is there a current George Aid? Is there somebody that has that now? I don't know what they're going to do with that, because when I, when I brought all that stuff up after... You told me you were going to be asking me about yeah, something. That's all right. No, just out of All that stuff up. And one of the the uh, documents that no, I, I have. have no, that's all right. You sit there. Okay. Fine. If you want to take those and look through them, fine. No, that's great. Okay. But one of the documents is that when I retired, I retired as the George A. Distinguished Professor of Philosophy Emeritus. Mm -hmm. So this now is an emeritus, John. 
I don't know if they can give another George A. That that's I don't an know. interesting question. Yeah, that's good. I hadn't thought about that. Let's talk about family. You have uh, children and they had whatever. one daughter. Okay. One daughter who married a Mets baseball pitcher when she was a student at the Paul. She was a good student, yeah, a good student. Student at the Paul when the Paul and those colleges go to Florida for the spring break. <laughs> And uh, the Mets were working out at the time there. So there was a long, yeah, there was a long story about that. They should write a book on it because it's interesting how the two got together. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was finishing his work at St. John's while he was pitching for the Mets. And then tore the, tore what do they call this? this a ligament or something that's yeah. in there. Yeah. A ligament there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ended his career. So he was a pitcher? Probably, yeah, was he a pitcher? He was a pitcher. Uh -huh. So he finished his work in banking and uh, they now live uh, on Long Island. Dix Hills, Long Island. She was her only child. And they have three children, two boys and a girl. The oldest is 21, had a 21st birthday. The next boy is 15, and then the girl is 11. All right, so that is the immediate family. And as long, when Jenny was still living, uh, yeah, well, he said, we have no problem now that a lot of families have of finding where are you going to go when you retire, close to which child. We only had the one. So we got this townhouse uh, close to close to where Heather and her family live. And on, Long on Long Island? On Long Island, okay. yeah. And close to State University of New York at Stony Brook, which is where I have three, also three former students on the faculty. So that's sort of my second university. Yeah. And another home. And another home. And another home. Mm -hmm. So you have your privacy, but are still close. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that's very nice. Um, another honor that you got was the Murphy Award, the Outstanding Teaching Award. That's nice. Okay. Are you in the Great Book of Teachers there too? That was, yeah. Okay. Actually, you see, teaching, teaching was my main reason for going into higher education. And again, it's, it's sort of a hard, to, hard to explain how sometimes this spirals into something else that gets legs and goes on. But when I was teaching, uh, and that was really my first passion, uh, it became crystal clear to me that you can never really dissociate good teaching from good scholarship, right? So I kept diligently working on the material that I was using in class and uh, was able to publish that. And then some of that turned into books and right. and uh, define my career as one of both teaching and scholarly publication. Right, very nice, nicely said. That's very nice. And yeah, and uh, I told my friends my swan song is the last one that I published with the press. Uh, doing philosophy with others. All right, that came out in June. It's a kind. It's a kind of autobiography. I guess a lot of academics feel that after they have once retire, then the world needs to know the story about <laughs> what they did. Okay. Which is what oral history is assisting with. It was right, right. That good okay. point. Okay, 
Now that's fine. That is fine. Except I found in reading some of these autobiograph autobiographies, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it's a kind of bogus classification. I don't think there is such a thing as an autobiography. Because a biography is always closely connected with biographies of other people with whom you studied and with whom you worked. Okay. Written by the individual. Written by the individual. The author. Right. right. So what I did, yes, uh, and philosophy, doing philosophy with others. Yeah, it does tell the story of my life because it, 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 it tells of important conversations that I had with some of the shakers and movers right. in my discipline uh, over the last 50 years. All right. But I, wanted to, I, I did this in such a way to show that advancement in philosophy is always a kind of combination of what the rhetor says to the interlocutor and the interlocutor responds to the rhetor. So you have a, a serious conversation in which you work something out and then you go home and you think, well, right, now this was my thought, this was his thought. So it's a very artificial separation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there is a sense in which has, this has to be understood as a kind of a continuing dialogue, conversational interaction, so that the, the rhetor, in my case, the, the writer of the book, isn't somehow set on a pedestal as the one who has organized it all by her or himself. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting how some of my colleagues respond to this. Yeah, but uh, I think I'm done with writing books. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you still? You know, and you were involved with a couple of the associations. The president at one time, and secretary of the Indiana Philosophical Society. Yes, yeah. I still go to this side, uh -huh. and particularly the society, the Society for Phenomenology and, and Existential and Philosophy. You were executive secretary. Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was involved in the organizing of that. I'm the only living member involved of, in the organization of the five that started that that society in 1961. Okay. John Wilde from Harvard, uh, Schrader from Yale, Jim Eady from Northwestern, John Anderson from Penn State and myself from Purdue. The five of us got together. I was a visiting professor at Northwestern at the time. We got together and decided that we need to have a separate society because of the growing interest in recent continental philosophy. So we met 1961 or two for the first time. All right, first meeting. I think we had something like 35 or 40 attendees. The next year we met again and there was a doubling of attendees. Currently, that society, which is going to celebrate its 50th anniversary in 2011, October, right, right, has grown to something like 1,400 members. Yeah. So that, yeah, that be a big year the, for again, you. not. I don't want to say it's my legacy. I, part of my legacy that the five of us were able to start something that got legs. And the same thing with the journal. That the journal that I started with Cockelmans and Anderson. Uh, the the uh, it was called Man and the World, but we changed it to 
Continental Philosophy Review, CPR. Mm -hmm. Continental Philosophy Review is, uh, is a journal that I helped found with Anderson and Conkerman, both of whom are now right. deceased. So I seem to be the one that's dangling along at the end. You're of right. Yeah. What about retirement activities? What have you been uh, keeping? Well, that goes back to not having your students retire. I've been teaching a Stony Brook. Yeah. Yeah. When do you go in? During just a, a quarter? semester. Okay, semester. Yeah, it's a visiting appointment. Yeah. Okay. And, and I've been, yeah, very much involved with the current university honors program. Are you at the university? Familiar with that? Yeah, at the at Purdue. At Purdue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's it? Osito. Chris Osito was the one who was in charge of that. He's done them. Yeah, he's got things going. My guess is they're they're gearing for a university honors college. See, like Penn State has. Okay. Arizona State has. Okay. And I was uh, involved in the first year they did this, it's an interesting experiment. Uh, they, special, they asked special uh, uh, teachers to see if they'd be interested in becoming involved in it. So they asked me if I'd be interested in doing something in philosophy. But they made it clear, not one of the courses you usually teach, right? No, we don't want an introduction to philosophy. We don't want a uh, advanced course on Kierkegaard or Heidegger. No, these are special students, special students, highly motivated with uh, good quality minds who need to get a kind of perspective, an interdisciplinary perspective of issues that might interest them. So I did it four year, first time we had four years ago. And I tell you, I was exhilarated in dealing with these, these bright, challenging, motivated students who I didn't know really existed. You see, problem with problem with developing a graduate program, you teach the graduate students and probably do the large lecture courses and intro, but it's the poor TAs who do all the work and get to meet the students. So I hadn't had the opportunity to, to really interact with really them. interact with these students, see? And they limit the number to twenty, not more than twenty in each of these courses. All right. So I've done that I did that three times. They called me this last September, I guess, or was it August, asked if I'd be willing to repeat the one I did last time, which is a kind of seminar. It has a little different format. Mm -hmm. So again, it was hard for me to say no because part of my life is involved in the development right. of this. Right, yeah. You going to do it in the spring then? Will it be? In the spring, okay. right, okay. yeah. This coming spring. spring. I'll be in the Does it go spring. for the whole? Sem does it be for the whole semester? Part, uh, the whole semester. Yeah, this whole semester. Okay. Yeah, so I'll have to come back from the townhouse from New York, uh, right after things, uh, right after Christmas. See, yeah, since Jimmy died, I pretty much have everything set in place. Spring, early spring, and fall are good times to be in Indiana. All right, spring in Indiana comes sooner than it does on Long Island. Summer is a good time to be on Long Island. <laughs> and Especially when you have a lot of 90 degree days around here, like right. this summer. And then uh, stay there for Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, and then come back. Yeah. So that's sort of my life, shuttling back and forth. That sounds Between good. the Big Apple and the big house, everybody asked me, why are you doing this big house? Well, 
I've learned you don't have to live in every room at the same time. You can move, you can move right. around. I can manage. That's right. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, in closing, is there something that I forgot to ask, or anything additional that you would like to uh, make a note Let's of? Let's see. Okay. What did I? I was experimenting. So, no, in closing, I just uh, want you to You look back on your long career. It's been wonderful. Express my thanks to Purdue University for, for giving me the opportunity to uh, do what I, I love to do, and that is teach and research issues in philosophy. And uh, I am following the students that I've taught with great interest who seem to be doing very well in the wider academic world. Good. Something like that. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Schrag. Okay. I appreciate that. That's